Hello, this is Amy Kyle, and in this session we're going to be talking about climate change. And this first presentation is about the science of climate change. And my main point is that the science supporting climate change is becoming ever more certain. And I'm going to start with weather, because we see weather all the time, and it's something that people relate to. And this is a slide from 2012 that was made by the Weather Bureau people at NOAA in the United States. And what they're doing is just pulling together different kinds of weather events that are related to the increasing energy in the atmosphere that comes with climate change. And no one would argue that every weather event is related to climate. You know, no one would say every hurricane, every rainstorm, every aspect of the drought. But what we have is an overall pattern of weather that's becoming more extreme. We're having more intense storms, we're having bigger floods, we're having more hurricanes, etc. And that is a pattern that is, that is consistent with greater energy in the atmosphere, which is part of what's happening with, happening with climate change. In the Arctic, we've seen a huge change in the amount of sea ice that's out there in the Arctic Ocean. I mean, it's just a, a shocking, stunning reduction in the amount of ice there. And this is, again, a readily observable effect that is widely viewed as related to climate. And then the, the intense storms, of course, people relate to those. There was a huge hurricane in the Philippines a couple of years ago, another one this year. And then these huge dust storms that can take over the desert. And again, no one would claim that all of this is related to climate. This tendency towards more extreme weather almost certainly is. So we also look at things that we can measure. Measuring CO2, carbon dioxide, which is the main greenhouse gas, is maybe the simplest thing that you can do. And I love this graph because it is so simple. This is a simple time series of the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere observed at the Mauna Loa Observatory in the island of Hawaii. And that's up pretty high, so it doesn't have quite the fluctuation you might see down lower. And they really can't be much simpler than this graph. They start in 1960. This is one of the longest running series of continued observations and they're measuring CO2 in parts per million. And some number around 350 is generally viewed as a critical number for how much CO2 can be in the atmosphere without important effects. And you can see that we're well over that. But every year, that you know, they have some variation in the year, but every year this pattern shows an increase. This is a more sophisticated and longer running estimate of the same thing. This doesn't go back 50 years, it goes back 400,000 years, so that's quite a while. And what they're showing here is, again, we're on this parts per million scale. 350 is right up around here. And they show a long-term up and down trend that's related to overall climate and warming and ice and stuff like that, but that has stayed at a maximum below 300 for 400,000 years until 1950, when it crept up over this kind of upper limit that it existed before and is heading up to where we are now, which is approaching 400. And I like this graph too. This is an early, very simple graph that was in the New York Times in 1998. And this is a composite of some different sources that researchers put together to figure out the temperature in the Northern Hemisphere over a period of time that started in 1400. And they have some variability in here and it goes up and down and so on and you can see that there is quite a bit of natural variability in the temperature so that's nothing new but again they're showing this pattern that started to go up in the 1900s above any level it had been at before so this is how the intergovernmental panel on climate change sums that up and this is their conclusion that humans are changing the climate and it is extremely likely that we are the dominant cause of warming since the mid 20th century. And what they put together here is an overall global average of both the land and ocean temperature in order to show you that time series. And that's important because a lot of the heat that is in the atmosphere is absorbed by the oceans. So you have to measure both to really understand where that energy has gone. And looking at it that way, they see the same sort of pattern. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been commissioned by the United Nations and the World Health Organization to bring together the scientists of the world to understand and assess climate change. And their last synthesis report came out in 2014. And this is one of their graphs that they prepared for people to use to 
explain their results. So the New York Times in 2007 said that the science panel, the same panel, at that time described global warming as unequivocal, meaning that there's no doubt that it's occurring. And also they started to talk about the evidence for the human role. We've seen a series of representations of temperature change. This is one from the U.S. for 2012. You know, they say, not even close, 2012 was the hottest ever. And they compare the number of un unusually hot versus unusually cold days, and the whole thing is skewing toward the hot. And you can see the hotter areas here. This is the global representation of the expected temperature trend that would compare observations centered around 1970 to those centered around 2020. And you can just see how much the temperature is expected to increase. 2020 isn't that far off at this point in time. You can also see how much greater the temperature change is up in the Arctic. And then there are other ways to look at this too. This is something that looks at the growing season. What is the increase in the length in number of days of the season when there's no frost? And then this is from California looking at the projected July temperature increases from a historical base back in 1961 to 1990. And you can just see how much greater the areas of extreme heat are going to become. Then we have the issue of sea level rise. This is just one representation of this. There are many, but as the sea level rises, areas will become inundated. Many coastal cities. This shows New Orleans, which of course was is subject to flooding already. So this is something that the National Climate Assessment put together to look at these various metrics that are relevant to see what the direction of them would be. So they're looking at the air temperature near the surface, the water vapor going up, and this is one way that the energy in the atmosphere is manifested by this increase in water vapor in the atmosphere. The temperature over the oceans going up, sea surface temperature going up, sea level going up, the content of heat in the ocean, as I mentioned before. Glaciers and ice sheets are diminishing. Those are important sources of water storage in a number of areas, including California, but also in Asia. The snow cover is diminishing. And we look at these all together, it becomes a pretty compelling picture. So their key message, again, this is from the so-called IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is that the human influence on the climate system is clear. The more we disrupt our climate, the more we risk severe, pervasive, and irreversible impacts. And also, hopefully, we have the means to limit climate change and build a more prosperous, sustainable future. And you might think that's just wishful thinking, but I would argue that in California, we have a very robust climate program. Perhaps not all that's necessary to stop climate change, but very robust change in, in energy use and energy sources. And it's only been good for the state. You know, it's been good for health, it's been good for communities, and the sky has not fallen. So this is just a picture of the increase in the so-called so greenhouse gases, GHG, between 20 and 2010. And that shows that it's going up more between 20 and 2010, the slope is increasing more. And they're counting CO2 from land use and also from fossil fuel and industrial processes, as well as methane and then uh, N2O. So it's not only CO2, but you know we won't, don't really wanna see that, do we? We know better now than to have this continuing to increase. And the sources that they illustrate here include the energy sector, agriculture, forests, and other uses, industry, transport, and then the building sector. There's counting issues of what you put here versus what you put here, but it gives you some idea of the kinds of things that they think we need to focus on. And I've showed you this before, sources of pollutants, a lot of them are these same things that we're talking about. In a health context already have impacts on climate change. And so bringing together our thinking about health, climate change can make a strong argument for doing something about a lot of these these very issues. Biomass burning also is contributing enormously to health effects, of course, and you've seen this slide before, but it also contributes to climate change. So we have a win-win scenario here in a way to look at these combustion-related sources in entirely new ways. And then I want to point out to you this way that they have started to represent this in the last couple of years. And this is this idea of the total amount of carbon burned. And they show this on the bottom of the graph. And this is a metric saying that, well, in the end, you can only burn so much carbon because the climate change is related to how much carbon you burn. 
And it's not really that much more complicated than that. So we gotta quit burning carbon in order to get a grip on this. And so a new metric that's emerging is, well, how much carbon can we take out of the ground? And that's part of what the debate is over fracking and over the oil sands is, well, if we can only take so much carbon out of the ground, why are we starting to develop these new sources? This is showing a global consensus that we need to limit the temperature increase globally to no more than 3.6 degrees. That's what this shows here, and this is in Fahrenheit. That's 2 degrees in centigrade. And they are graphing this according to the amount of the carbon that's been burned. And so these are actual historical data up to about here to 2010. And then they show the projections of where this is expected to go. And you can see that we can't continue to let this increase that much or we will get above this point that is, is broadly viewed as ruinous. And some people think this number is too high and it really needs to be a little bit lower. But it's kind of a simpler way to think about it. It's not really so much that we're counting a gazillion different things, it's that we're counting the burning of carbon. And then I also wanted to show you this. This just came out this fall, and this is where the panel finally decided to say that the effects are becoming irreversible in that we cannot go back to where we were before. And so we will be in some process of adapting to climate change even as we try to make it stop. So to sum this, climate change is occurring and is probably irreversible. Probably is too, probably not a strong enough word there. I think they say it is irreversible at this point. There are multiple lines of evidence that are converging, including these concentrations of CO2, as well as temperatures on land and the sea and others that I showed you. And climate change will cause health effects directly and indirectly, and we'll need to be both adapting to it and mitigating it. So the subsequent presentations will focus on those issues.